Look at that. So am I. That's a good picture, right? We all have good pictures. It's all, it's all different. Um, hey, guys, we're live on YouTube, on the TED Show YouTube channel. Uh, welcome. So I'm with my friend Joe Lopez. Uh, we're going to talk about all things America, community, uh, law enforcement, you name it today. Uh, and we're giving it a shot today on the YouTube, our YouTube channel. So we've got YouTube going up live, and then we're about to do Facebook Live. So give Joe uh, all your love when you see him. And uh, if you have questions, I will keep an eye on it. I'll keep an eye on the up live too. Um, nothing can't be done. I love that. See, so you get this. You get Susie, Susie, Susie Diddle Coconuts fan. Hi, Susie. All right. So love you guys. We won't be, we'll be back. All right. So we're ready to go. Let's go live on Facebook. It's just low connection, but here we go. Hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday, May 22nd. Uh, let us know you can hear us or see us. I'm with Joe Lopez today. We've got Up Live going. We've got YouTube Live going. Uh, but that looks so good because it's from a distance and you can't see all my wrinkles or the shininess <laughs> on my head. Uh, so I'm kind of liking that too. Um, yeah, please, yeah, go ahead and share. No, it's good. So Joe Lopez, I think I can see Tyler. Hey, let, let me know you can hear us or see us. Joe, of course, is on. Uh, Caitlin, you can hear us or see us. So okay. kind of love Caitlin. She's, <laughs> the, she's the best. I don't even like to call her intern because she's so much more part of the family. So welcome, my friend. Uh, you, you have a whirlwind of things that you are working on and doing uh, because you're running for office. So tell them what you are running for. Uh, Ted, thank you for, for the invite. Of uh, course. I like uh, appreciate the uh, ambiance here. So Beautiful, I right? Yeah, it's, I mean, look, I can see all. You're relaxed. Yeah, Orange County. Take a deep, deep yeah, breath nice. for a minute. Good view. I'm running for Orange County Sheriff. That's what I'm doing. That's why I'm here. Orange County Sheriff. All right. So one thing I told Joe is that we'll get to that part, but uh, we want to know more about Joe Lopez. So he wasn't born and then all of a sudden wanted to be Orange County Sheriff. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you did from the time you were born. Now, if you cannot tell me, let's, let's try to get to first grade by at least 20 minutes in. Uh, so if you can give us a little history on you and your background, and then let's get to your why. Why did you start getting involved in uh, politics and why did you become a sheriff? Why did you become a, an officer? Well, um, for, 40 years is what I've uh, been serving the community for 40 years. 40 years. I started out as an altar boy uh, in the Bronx. Uh, in the oh, you're a Bronx boy. I, yeah, I'm a Bronx, no I'm a Bronx boy. Yeah. Do you still have family up there? Uh, no, no, I had to think for a second. They're all, they're all gone. They're the all Bronx gone. hasn't quite made it like now. I, I was born in Northeast Jersey. So, Joycey, Bergen County. Uh, so, I just remember places like Brooklyn, Park Slope, Williamsburg. Those were the no-go places. And now they're the Shishi, uh, Brownstones, where everybody wants to live. And it's almost past Shishi now. So, are they are they moving into the Bronx, I wonder? I love all the food up there. I miss it. Yeah, well, especially the pizza. The pizza, right? You can't buy, you can't buy any pizza like you buy in New York. <laughs> you still got that little accent. I love it. How long have you been <laughs> down here? Uh, <laughs> I moved from New York, uh, from the Bronx in uh, 77. Okay, so you've been out 41 years. Yeah. yeah wow. wow. That's and you time. still have, see, I, I can still talk like that if I have to, or law and daughter, but okay. I, don't, I I lost it. I lost it. Oh, all right. my, my wife and my, my, my kids, they all make fun of me. I say fada. I, tomate, tomate, <laughs> Wait, tomate, say that tomate. one again? You fada. say fada? Fada, yeah, my fada. <laughs> my fada. And, my fada. And do you say mutta? Mutta. Who's your mother? No, no. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. We've got a question over there, Caitlin, that I can't see. So you'll have to let me know. Um, hey, Vic. Said, hey, neighbor. We had a great coffee talk in Avalon Park. Vic, Hashtag being educated voter. Vic Colazzo is big in Avalon Park, but I went to college with him. So I've known Vic for, you know, when did we graduate, Vic, like five, six years ago? Uh, so I've known Vic for a long time. Hugely involved in the community, so he uh, obviously enjoyed his coffee with you. Yes, he was a uh, very good. He, he shared his uh, concerns of the Avalon Park, which were not surprising with me because I've been living there for 12 years when I came up from Miami. But 
He's a, you know, he's a icon of the community, so he knows what's going on. He's got his finger on the pole. So. I like it. You're an yeah. icon, Vic. We're going <laughs> to use that as your hashtag from now on. My wife gave you gave you that name. So, <laughs> all right. So, grew up in the Bronx, and then what happened? How, you didn't move here till '77. So, what were you doing right. up there? What were so your interests? In the, in the Bronx, I was an older boy. I went to Catholic school. I was an older boy for four years, uh, serving uh, God in uh, my community there, and I became a uh, also a Cub Scout. Uh, I was a, uh, a naval cadet in New York and became a Boy Scout. And then my mother, uh, we escaped uh, from uh, from the Bronx and went to uh, went to Las Vegas. Believe it or not, you went to Vegas. Vegas. Now to- that's an interesting trajectory over to Vegas because normally anybody from up north Florida is really the first and only option. Yeah, you kind of go south. You go west. south. <laughs> Head west. Head west, yeah, young man. We went with the settlers. So. <laughs> So why out there? What was out there? Um, my mother wanted to take us out of the out of the city because you know the crime. You know it was. Sure. You know my 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 mother is a uh, she's divorced. Uh, when we were young, she worked in two jobs, basically growing up in the streets. So she, just you, me and my sister. Oh, you have a sister too. Yeah, me and my sister, and uh, you know um, from there we went uh, to Vegas and we stayed there for a year, and uh, came back to uh, back to New York only for another year to kind of. Uh, get away from there was different because you didn't have any have any family out there. It was a little bit different. Uh, it's and, hard when you make a move like that and you have no <clears throat> like resources, no family resources or assistance. Yeah, no support system. Yeah, you know you have to. What the support system is what you create yourself. Correct. And it's not already established. And they came to my from New York. We, it was a short trip to from to New York back to New York. Then in New York we lived in Washington Heights, and then uh, back to Miami. 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 All right. So Miami was your place. Why Miami? Did you have family down there? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you know, the Cubans migrated from the, from Cuba, uh, to Miami. So, uh, growing up in New York, uh, we were kind of away from the, our culture, but yes, we had family down in Miami, went down there. Of course, uh, uh, I didn't really ask my mom, uh, the real reason, but I wanted to think because it was warmer. So. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just too cold. Nothing against my Northern family or friends. But it is just beautiful. It might not look so pretty out here, but when you walk out, you're not freezing. Yeah. Uh, you still have more sunshine down here than in anywhere else up north. No offense again. I yeah. still love my friends, but I can't imagine they've had the, one of the worst winters on the planet. Oh, no. You can have that snow. So in Cu- so in Cuba, in Miami, well, here Miami we go. Is I've got Cuban, Cuban, Cuban. I've got Cuban <laughs> food on my mind. That's yeah. why I was thinking, oh it's God, I'll, I want to talk about all the cu- Cuban food, but. Um, so in in Miami, what happened then? Did you? Yeah, I went to high. I graduated high school there, and uh, and I ended up in the in the Marines, the United States Marines, and I did that for almost uh, four and a half years. Thanks for serving. See, I didn't know that. See, when you send the bios over, um, I try to read them, uh, but I want my guests to read them because that's that's so that helped train you for um, your next career move. And by the way, that really is amazing service. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's prepared me. Uh, the Marine Corps is, it still has a lot of responsibilities and the young man, uh, you know, uh, to give him that foundation. So, yes, it's prepared me for a lot of things in life that I've come to. And then after that, I became a state trooper in 1983. How is the transition out? We talk, we have a lot of veterans that come on the show. And one of the biggest things is always the transition from being in the military to civilian life. Was that difficult for you um, or was that just easy because you jumped right into being a trooper? No, it took me two years to become a trooper after I got out of the Marine Corps, but you are right, Ted. Uh, a lot of uh, veterans do have those challenges, some more than others. Uh, I did have uh, second thoughts by going back in. I was going to go back in. You come from a regimented, structured life. And of course, life in the civilian life, it's, it's different. And, it, you know, and they warned us about that as you're getting out, that it's not going to everything's not going to be regimented. Uh, not everybody does things for the reasons for what they do. So you, you go through that transition. So you have to find a pillar, a support, a something that you can uh, find to have conversations with people and how you can adapt to that. And the, the problem this is once you acclimate, you know, into that society, you don't want to go back. But. It's, yeah, right. it, it is. There's, there's a brotherhood, a sisterhood. There's there's structure. That's what I hear a lot about from veterans is that you know every day you're looking out for your brothers and sisters. You're 
you're you have a structure to the way things are there's a um, chain of command it's all very structured and then when you come out here nothing is like that so did you find is that one of the reasons why you were attracted to becoming a trooper yeah uh, it's still para paramilitary i applied to become a trooper uh, the minute I, uh, I got out of the marines actually i applied with several police departments uh the florida high patrol was the first ones to call me um, and, um, and that's one of the reasons why I went with them. And did it give you, so as you go in, did it give you the sense, the same sense, or at least similar sense of that camaraderie and support from the get go? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. From the get go. And yeah. so what, what happens when you, so you graduate, I'm, I've never, I've never served, obviously I've never been part of a trooper. I can't even imagine me. I would fail the first exam to try to. <laughs> walk five feet uh you all have to really go through a lot of training did your military training help with the training that you uh had to go through as a trooper yeah as a matter as a matter of fact you know we had uh, all different types of cultures of people coming in and you had people who'd never been in the military people who were in college and uh and and they had challenges with military things i had believe it or not i had challenges with the ac academic because i'd never been in a in a an environment academic environment before so that's how we all came together. So I helped them with the military. I, I used to go and make everybody's bed, you know, when I was in the academy. So what academic did you not have? Um, well, it's it's a for, it's a formal the structure, the continuing studying of the laws, the constitution, and all those things that you have to do that you that the skills my skills were rusty. Right. I probably put sure. it that way. So skill in academically wise, um, and so when I came, so when I got there. You had the other uh, um, recruits who could not, you know, make in their bed. You know, right. we had to make our bed because you're sleeping in the academy. You don't go home until. And the there's place. a real method to the madness of a military bed and how you make. Oh it. yeah, yeah. With and the your hospital. spit shines shoes yep. and um, all of that is true, and that's all part of learning how to the structure and the. Um, the responsibility and making sure that you do things in a consistent way, which is what the military is all about. The consistency, I think, and you can talk about it more, uh, the consistency, not only in military, but in as a police officer, as a trooper, you have to all be on the same page, right? Yes. So because out, out in, out in the, out in the world, if you're not on the same page with your, uh, fellow police officers, your fellow troopers, then it can mean life or death um, based on the particular event. Yeah, or it's, it's a safety concern, but not only for the, the, uh, the trooper, but even for the public. Well, of course. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's what happens is a lot of people think, uh, okay, you go in, it's super easy to get through six weeks of boot camp or six weeks, however long the training is. <laughs> and it's just so not, months. I'm six sweating months. thinking about it. Six uh, months. Yeah, it's a, it's, but there's a reason for it. They have to figure out how to, uh, because you're doing something that so many people would never consider doing. And it's a job that um, it's kind of like the you can't handle the truth thing that Jack Nicholson says, the things that you all do, not only from as a Marine or from armed services, but also as a police officer, as, some, as law enforcement, uh, people don't believe the things that you all have to see and do and deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, they, they you know, there is a, uh, a joke amongst law enforcement officers, you know, we're doctors, we're priests, we're psychologists, we're social workers, uh, you know, first responder, all that because of what we deal with on a, on a continuous basis. So when you graduated and then you became Trooper Lopez, is that what you were? Yeah, Trooper okay. Joe Lopez. Trooper Joe Lopez. And then what happened? I'm fascinated by this. And I'm going to, you know, the, what I get mostly is from law and order. I don't know, from a police <laughs> academy. I mean, you... There are things that we just don't know, and TV obviously tries to portray some of it, but we don't know. So you graduated, and then all of a sudden, are you in a car? Are you on a horse? Are you in K-9? Are you, uh, um, what just are get, you doing? They just got rid of the horses when I got there. Oh, they so. just got rid of the horses. <laughs> Not the wild, wild west. Uh, so what did you do next? Like you were assigned to a partner, or you assigned to a specific type of law enforcement yeah when you first come on you know you go to an fto program so you have a field training officer so he trains you for 10 weeks so i, I went through that and then you're assigned to patrol you're giving you're given a car you're given equipment uh back then that was an 1880 
a 1983 Dodge Diplomat is what's wow. That's yeah. a isn't a Diplomat a big car? No, uh, it looks like a box, a box car. The seats still recline. AM <laughs> AM radio. Oh yeah. So it, did you try? Were you um, on patrol? Yes, patrol. I patrol okay. the streets of Miami. You patrol the streets of Miami, and how is that different from the streets of Orlando? Uh, well, back then, you know, uh, I, I came on in the '80s, so you had the cocaine cowboys. So, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, you had that and you had the riots going on in the city of Miami. So that was a constant thing uh, going on. I mean, it was, it, uh, you know, you know, people say I had the I had the best seats and the best show on earth. So. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. Right. Yeah. I'm fascinated by the stories whenever I hear uh, any of my uh, law enforcement friends talk about the stories. I'm I'm dumbfounded, I think. And even as much TV uh, as I've watched, you really can't catch the nitty gritty of it. I mean, maybe the closest thing was cops that show, which my son-in-law happens to love. And there's another one that uh, a lot of, a lot of people now I'm taking you back some time now. It's a uh, real stories of the highway patrol. Oh yeah. I remember that show. I forgot all about that. Yeah, I, had, I was on it uh, seven times. Oh, you were on it. Yes. What was that like? So were cameras following you and you just did what you had to do no matter what? Yeah. You know, it was awkward in the beginning because you get in the car and you get this guy sitting next to you with the big camera, you know, stick almost, you know, <laughs> inches away from you. And you're just supposed to act normal. I you love know? it. So, <laughs> and then, uh, and then they're asking you questions and what you see on TV is you answering those questions. You don't hear the questions being asked. Then you got the, uh, uh, you got the reporter in the back seat, So nobody knows he's there and the camera guy is there. So he goes everywhere with you. I don't know how those guys did it. They're carrying in a thing on their shoulder. And every time I did a traffic stop, even when I was running out, I was running after these guys, I was on a foot pursuit. And uh, going behind houses and and going over fence, and he was keeping up with me. But you wow. could, yeah, you could hear me on the mic yelling on the mic, getting on the radio. But you couldn't see me, and uh, I had to, I had to, I mean, I, the fence. I don't think it was, you know, fences, shorter than ten man. feet. Yeah. But here's the thing: like the guy in the back, and then I want to move on to you moving to Orlando, um, or wherever you moved after Miami. The guy with the big camera. I always have this vision of him breathing super hard in the camera because how he's not trained to run like you're running or or he's probably scared out of his mind with some of this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they by the time they got to me, they've already been with other troopers before. So, uh, but they, they're probably used to it. Uh, and, you know, you get to know these guys and, and, and you make them feel comfortable and, and you tell them what to do. You know, you know, there's yeah, you get rules of engagement. Hey, listen, this happens. Stay here. I don't want you to get hurt. You know, but they they're diving in head. I first. Love it. Yeah. All right. So what, what brought you here to Orlando? I got promoted to lieutenant. I took a promotion, came up here to Orlando. So you're a lieutenant when I came up here, when you came up here. Yes. OK. And so what does that mean? Does that mean you get to sit behind the desk all day long and do nothing like the lieutenants and um in uh, my favorite show, I keep referring to Law and Order SVU. Yeah, it's probably one of the things I didn't like about uh, when you get promoted uh, up, up the ranks. Yeah, Lieutenant, when I got promoted, Lieutenant, I came up here, I was a shift commander. So I was stuck in the radio room, uh, you know, with, with all the dispatchers and everything. So uh, there was a joke and people used to make says, how are we going to tie him down, tie him, tie him down to the chair? Because he's going to want to go out there. I'm coming from the streets of Miami, right. being out there and then I'm being tied up. I didn't get promoted until... I had like 18 years on. Wow. I mean, I would imagine that if you're in the action all the time, it would be very hard to go to a desk job. It, it would be the opposite for me. I like the desk job. So I would be, I would imagine it would be very hard for me to go out in the field. No, uh, yeah, it, it, it is hard. So, uh, of course, as you go up in rank, you know, you got some discretion where you can balance that, you know, go out on the street, go behind the desk. Of course, my mom and my wife and everybody all want me behind the desk. Of course. Yeah. How is that? So you, Let's talk about family because you have a family. You put it in your bio. Yes. You have a family. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. He has a family. And so how is that? Is it as difficult as I would imagine it is on your family when you go out, when you were going out each night um, or going out even on any shift? It doesn't have to be night anymore. Yeah. My uh, my wife, I've uh, been married to her for to be 28 years. And she's watching. Congratulations. Can say, can say hello to her. Say hi to her. Of yeah. course. I'm said, whatever. I love you. Uh, I love it. And, um, you know, she she handled it pretty well. The thing is that she met me in this job already. So, so she knew, did she, so a lot of times, so she knew what she was getting into. But once you're married, does then it become like, wow, I knew, but I didn't really know. Um, kind of, sort of. I was pretty good. I guess you could call it sheltering. 
I didn't tell her everything. Right. You know, you want to you want to keep certain information away because they're not, you know, uh, they get worried to death. You know, they, you know, just like you, you know, my mom. You know, they, sure. they they had to go through that when I went to the Marines and they sent me to Nicaragua. So I know what it is, what kind of toll it takes on a family because they're worrying about their loved ones. So I try to shelter them so they wouldn't know. For us, it's you know, it's you know, you you, you get into this because it's a sense of duty. You know, it's a purpose. Sure. And so it's not just a, not like a job. It's it's a calling that you have to do. Correct. So it's for us, it's no big deal. Well, it's in your do. blood. I feel like, like I feel like, um, from what I can see, you have this passion, and I think you have to have that passion in order to be impactful and successful at what you do. Because the minute that that passion or that you start questioning yourself, obviously it can be uh, super impactful on the on the job when you're working in that. Yeah, uh, look, you got to pay the bills. You know, I didn't get into this job to, to get rich or anything. Of course, it, it, you pay it for it. But there's some days that you're saying that I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. You know, it's, it's oh, so, that's good to hear. Yeah, I always worry. I, I always think when I think of all of my law enforcement friends, I'm like, how do we just don't pay them enough? We really don't. That's my opinion, not Joe's. Well, <laughs> it, it's true because uh, you know, you do have commitments and you do have a family you got to raise and you want to make sure that your family gets the best out of life. They go to the good schools, sure. they live in the good neighborhoods, so they don't have to worry about uh, all the things that, that we're dealing with. So, you know, that does come into play. All right. So now we've gotten the history. Now I've got to ask you the big why. So you are running for office, which as we all know, can be probably one of the biggest Herculean tasks on the planet. And it can be, uh, I mean, talk about taking a toll on personal life, family life, business, job. What was your why? Why, why now? Why get involved? Um, what's your thought process on the, on the what, what made you or motivated your epiphany, I guess, to get involved? I served my country, and I was very grateful for that. I served the state of Florida. Uh, now I'm at the community county level and i want to continue to serve in my community most people wonder in life what purpose they served i don't have that problem i have a, a it's a i have a passion for serving my community it's a sense of duty to continue to serve my mission is not over uh, part of that what i want to do is because I, when i first got here i was a victim of a crime we were uh they broke into my car and, and i haven't been a victim of a crime in, even in miami so what i want to do is i want to make sure that this is a safe place for everybody who they can raise their families, where the kids can go to school and return safely, where our wives can go shopping and they come back and they reach safely. So I want to be sure we reduce the crime in Orange County. I want to build the community, bridge that gap between law enforcement and the community. I think there's some kind of disconnect there, not because it's a fault of any local agencies here, but that's the, that's the sentiment nationwide. But we can do better here locally. We can do a lot better and, 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 and bring down those barriers so that we can have those relationships with law enforcement. The other thing is we need the more law enforcement. We need more deputies on the street. I agree. The population uh, is growing and fastly, quickly and immensely. Uh, we haven't kept up with that growth here. Some areas are not, you know, the calls are holding. We need to, you know, they're growing. They're, they're moving to Florida. You know, it's a place to move to, bring fam people are bringing their families here, and we need to increase the sheriff's office uh, at a faster pace. And we have to, day one, when I get in here, I'm going to review the hiring practices from top to bottom to make sure we fill these positions, that we get the brightest and the best on the department. So how do, how do the uh, officers get funded, meaning? Um, we all, I believe, 100% just being in, involved in the, little bit that I feel like I am, that I know that we need more officers. So does that come from a county budget? Do the feds uh, put money in? How How is it that we know that that is such an important issue, and yet it feels like from a community standpoint that you all who are in charge are always having to fight to get more officers? The, the public safety is the largest expense in any government. Okay, whether state and the local government, it's a, it's a big uh, price tag. It's fully funded from the county. However, there are some programs that are grant funded, you know, community oriented policing, where we had that in the Florida Highway Patrol, we hired 50 troopers for community policing. 
and the federal government subsidized some of that, uh, those salary dollars. But that's all, that was only like for a three-year program. So yes, it's fully, it's mainly fully funded from the county, and then the county uh, through their tax base is how they fund the, the positions. But we there's there's programs that you can uh, get from the uh, the federal government. So now you have the school resources officers. So there there's dollars for that to put both school resource officers in the schools. So that's one that's one approach. Uh, we have to be uh, we have to think outside of the box. We have to be smarter about how we do this. But we have to find ways. It has to be done because the people want action. They are. They want. They're. I'm listening. I'm going out to the community, and that's what they're telling me. We need more deputies on the street. We need to pay them more. The Orange County Sheriff's Office is losing deputies to other police departments because of the pay. So we spend what a hundred thousand dollars to train, equip, uh, and pay a deputy, only to do what? Two or three years later, he gets recruited from a local police department because they pay they pay them better. That's wasted money. That's not that's not good business. Seth, I mean, I, I I love to hear. It makes me sad, but I love to hear that because I think a lot of people don't realize that we're we we're losing great officers because our county is not paying them better. And what would be the what's the rationale behind not paying them better? Is it because there just isn't funding? And you guys all know this, and I'll just say it for the record, I ask these questions that I don't know the answers to. There's no rhetorical question here. Like I, I honestly don't know. And I think, but I think a lot of people uh, don't know. They don't understand why would we ever lose someone? We're Orange County. We have Disney. We're rich. We're, we, we have this, all the tourism here. And yet we are losing officers to other places. Why? It's probably a combination of, of, of several things. Uh, at one point, it was funding. You know, what, when we when the economy took a hit in 2008 and 2009, sure, that's that was the start of it. And I think uh, maybe we haven't gotten back to that. I, but I, I really think a lot of it has to do with politics. Uh, I think uh, the leaders need to advocate for uh, the, the public safety officers in knowing that we don't need a pay raise only when somebody's up for election. We need, they need to make sure that these guys are getting the benefits and the pay all the time. And now you create a compression problem. What's that com compression problem? Well, you go so many years without a pay raise. Now the guy who's just coming on, he's making the same amount of money as the person who's yeah. been here for six years. Well, you got a compression, compression problem. Yeah. And that's going to cost millions of dollars to fix. So why, how do we get there to begin with? So it has to be, it has to be a maintenance program. Between, and that's what it used to be done in the days. Nobody's coming on here to get rich. That's not what we're talking about. We say, you know, we try to take care of the families. You know, it's, it's a job. It's a demanding job. These guys are working sometimes, you know, double duty so they can make overtime to raise their families. They shouldn't have to be doing that. I agree 100%. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's frustrating for me when I do because I get to meet a lot of really cool law enforcement people. And normally the number one thing is, is you know, I'm not trying to be rich. I love what I do. I have a passion, like you said earlier. But it would be nice not to be on the low end of the spectrum of uh, law enforcement and have to struggle or take on extra jobs or work the double shifts. And to me, as public servants in general, just don't get the respect, nor do they get the funding that they need. And I just think it's such a I mean, it's it's critical in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes they don't say, hey, you know, nothing's going on out of sight, out of mind, like insurance, you know, no hurricanes. Right. You go 10, 20 years without a hurricane, people start canceling the insurance. The minute correct. they see a hurricane on the horizon, oh, they're running <laughs> to the insurance company. They're running. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing when it comes to law enforcement. But you got to keep it and you got to keep it in, 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 in intact and making sure that they're taken care of. I agree. All right. So um, we're going to share all of Joe's uh, elect. Joe Lopez, Facebook, anything that he's got, we're going to share it after the show. Actually, on all three shows, I will make sure we share it. Um, any parting words of wisdom from them? Anything you want to share with them? And you've got more time than just a little bit. But if you want to share something with them, something that's coming up, a fundraiser you have coming up, um, or some, some kind of words of wisdom for them. Because I think people really, I feel like this election year, uh, this year especially, people really do want to be educated and they do want to make some choices that make sense for them. And so if we can uh, reach them and connect with them, um, what would you say? What do you want to share with them? First of all, I want to give you my Facebook page. If you go to Facebook, it's Joe Lopez for Sheriff. 
and I have another one, Joe Lopez, and I have a, a, a web page, joelopezforsheriff.com. Uh, it's very important, like Ted said, you got to come out and vote. That's the only way things are going to change. Come out and vote in November. There's a primary. I'm not in a primary in August. I will be in the election in November 6th of this year. You got to come out and vote. I guarantee you nobody else, nobody else will work harder than me. When you vote for me, you're going to get uh, integrity, loyalty, and effective leadership. You can take that to the bank. I love it. All right. So two things. Um, we will, again, we'll share all of uh, Joe's information. Um, we are, this week, we are blessed to be sponsored by Strata Software. Uh, Ray Ortega, he's amazing. What a great guy. He was on the show yesterday. I want to give him a shout out. But I want to encourage you uh, to reach out to Joe. Reach out to Joe Lopez. All of these questions that are coming up and down on Facebook, we're friends on Facebook. So he'll be able to go to the video and respond. So if I haven't hit your question, if I haven't answered it, if he hasn't answered it, if you have questions after we've shut down the show, ask them uh, because he's, he wants to engage. I, I, think, I think that's the great part, the engagement that we're feeling in our world of, I hate the word politics, but in our world of running for office. Um, I think right now people are really expecting it because there are 5,000 new ways to engage with people. So utilize them, guys. Utilize them. So uh, we love you guys so much. I'll see you about 2.30. We're going to do a show called This Is America, which will tune. And I will send any questions that you have uh, directly to Joe, I promise. And